So last lecture we talked about um, basically the after the First World War, uh, how aviation basically got started in Edmonton uh, with all these uh, pilots coming back. Uh, they launched into aviation as a business. Uh, a lot of them were initially very successful because a lot of people wanted to go for essentially joy rides. Uh, and then very quickly, uh, the business kind of petered out and uh, it was a, a very fast burning flame. So unfortunately, uh, it, it almost killed the aviation industry in, 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 in Edmonton, at least. And if it wasn't for um, a few very determined people and some uh, very specific projects, uh, we would have lagged quite a bit behind. But because of these projects, we ran, managed to catch up in the late 20s and uh, it was this, these efforts in the late 20s that really made Edmonton uh, an aviation city. So in 1924, Watt May got together with the city engineer, who was Albert Walker, or Bert Haddo, uh, to basically hammer out a plan for a proper municipal aerodrome at the Hegman Farm. So the Hegman Farm had been used by the Edmonton Aircraft Company. Uh, you know, it's essentially where the municipal airport, I was going to say is, but used to be. Uh, and it was very quickly abandoned after that company uh, failed. But they did have a hangar, and it was a potential aerodrome. So they presented their idea to City Council in October of 1924, but it didn't really make much of a splash yet, except for uh, with Mayor Kenneth Blatchford. He actually thought this was a pretty good idea, but the timing wasn't quite right. So the proposal didn't actually come before City Council until May of 1926, two years later. The city already owned the Hegman property. Uh, they came into possession of it when uh, the Edmonton Aircraft, sorry, the Edmonton Airplane Company failed uh, for non-payment of taxes, and there was a family that was um, farming the land. Kenneth Blatchard uh, is a pretty interesting character. He moved to Edmonton from Manitoba as a kid, uh, and he worked quite a few odd jobs in Edmonton before becoming the mayor. Um, so he operated a grist mill during the gold rush, um, and he was an employee of the Edmonton Power Plant. He was first elected to city council in 1921. Uh, and back then there was only one year terms. So uh, he was elected for a one year term as an alderman, re-elected re re to a two year term in the 1922 election. Uh, then he resigned, ran for mayor in 1923 and one, was re-elected in 24 and 25. So, uh, you know, he managed to get re-elected year to year, but there was a lot of volatility and uh, not a lot of long-term planning uh, or a lot of potential for long-term planning. But luckily, uh, he got the aviation bug. What may, though, um, after the Imperial oil flights up to Norman Wells, uh, things slowed down significantly for aviation and especially for Watt May. Uh, and he also met Violet Bode, who is an English woman who had moved to Canada. Uh, she'd moved to Edmonton via Victoria and Calgary, uh, and they met at a horse show, and she was an equestrian. Uh, they later met because she was also a receptionist at the city commissioner's office, and they started dating, and soon enough they were engaged to be married, uh, and in November of 1924 made it official, which uh, warranted quite a few articles in the Edmonton Journal. Uh, so this one here is on the woman's page, uh, just talking about the warrior of many battles bows to Cupid's dictates. Uh, and then also in the sports section, where what may crashes, but... Uh, he falls in love, essentially. So because of this marriage uh, and the downturn in the aviation economy in Edmonton, uh, he was really needing to find steady work, and he knew that aviation wasn't really at, ready at that time. He had a lot of mechanical skills. Uh, he had worked for his uh, family business. Uh, so he decided to take a new job with the National Cash Register, National Cash Register Company. So to do that, the young couple moved to Ohio in the summer of 1925 so that he could train on their machines uh, and become a cash register repair person. Oops. So while there, uh, he's working on a lathe and a small uh, splinter of steel flies off the lathe and into his right eye. He's rushed to the hospital. Um, the doctors are initially, they remove the piece of steel and they're initially hopeful that he's gonna regain a full sight. But unfortunately, that's not the case, and the damage would, was permanent. So this is an article from the Edmonton Journal at the time. So Captain Watt May, who sustained an injured eye from flying pieces of steel, yada, yada, yada. Uh, it is confidently expected that normal sight will be restored. Um, 
This was actually a lie, and the damage was permanent. So he and Vi had to keep the secret as long as possible because uh, they knew that if uh, the full extent of his injury was known, he would lose his flying license. And he did really hope to get back to flying one day. Uh, if you've seen the recent uh, short film, What May a Blind Ambition, they cover this uh, in pretty good detail. So this is a screenshot from the recent movie. So <clears throat> with nothing much happening in Edmonton, I'm going to skip around a little bit and leave our Edmonton bubble. So we'll talk about aviation uh, in Canada, in Alberta, and just how it ties back into Edmonton. So first we have the Canadian Air Force of 1920 to 1924. So it's formed by the Canadian Air Board, uh, mainly to meet the responsibilities for the air defense of Canada. It primarily started as an air militia and managed by the Air Board, and mainly to give refresher courses to veterans at Camp Borden in Ontario. So between 1920 and 1928, there was about 1,300 airmen and 550 officers that completed a 28-day course at Camp Borden. The idea was to keep them current so that if war broke out, Canada would have a reserve of trained pilots and trained mechanics uh, and, and officers uh, in order to furnish our own air force uh, during the war. In April of 1924, they're given the Royal Prefix and they become the Royal Canadian Air Force with a grand total of 62 officers and 252 airmen on strength. Pretty small. Uh, and initially, most of the work that was done by the RCAF uh, was not very military in nature. They were doing photo surveys, airlifts, um, casualty evacuation flights, airmail delivery flights, fishery patrols, border patrols, transportation for government officials. So uh, not so much a fighting and bombing uh, perspective. So the Air Board became the responsibility of the Department of National Defense in 1922, uh, who in turn made the Canadian Air Force responsible for all flying operations in all of Canada, so military and civilian. So at this time, the Air Force is essentially the overarching body for military and civilian flying. The Canadian Air Board began operating in High River, uh, the High River Air Station in January of 1928. Uh, I have, I'm not dyslexic, but for some reason I want to call High River High Prairie or High Level. So if I do that, just ignore me. I'm only talking about High River today, which is in Southern Alberta. Uh, so this Canadian uh, uh, air station initially operated operated in Morley, Alberta, but the weather in Morley was pretty terrible for flying, very unpredictable. Uh, so they abandoned Morley and moved it to High River. And at first they had pretty much an entirely civil function, uh, and they were the largest air station in Canada. They were furnished by a gift of uh, about 10 war surplus aircraft that Great Britain, Great Britain had sent to Canada after the First World War. And during the late uh, 1922 reorganization of the Air Board and the Canadian Air Force, the operations at High River came under the umbrella of the Canadian Air Force, and then in turn the Royal Canadian Air Force. And typically their flights were um, mainly forestry patrols of the foothills and the mountains uh, west of High River. Uh, they also conducted aerial photography flights, uh, parachute trials, pest control, uh, and they did a lot of experiments with wireless radio communication. So in conjunction with the Canadian Corps of Signals, uh, they erected North America's largest radio transmitter in High River. Pr primarily, uh, early on, they're flying the Airco DH-4, later su supplemented by the Avro Viper, and then in 1928, the de Havilland Moth, at that time a Cirrus Moth. Uh, so the aircraft here is an Airco DH-4, uh, Garth Charlie Yankee Delta Mike of the Canadian Air Board in High River in 1922. So back in Edmonton, we skip to 1926, uh, and Mayor Blatchford decides to really start seriously working on this idea of a municipal aerodrome in Edmonton. So he turns to Major uh, Cuff, of the, uh, the commander of the Royal Canadian Air Force Station in High River, and asks for his opinion on the Hagman Farm and its suitability as a potential aerodrome. So he comes to Edmonton, uh, does a reconnoiter of the Hagman Farm, and tells them that as it stands, it's really not suitable, but with a lot of work, or a moderate amount of work, it could be made to be a fairly decent airfield. So the idea goes before City Council, and on the 10th of May, 1926, the city votes to fund uh, $400 for the construction of an airport at the Hagman Farm. Uh, $400 in 1926, when you factor inflation, is about equivalent to $6,500 in 
2022. So really not a lot of money um, when, you, when you factor up the cost. <clears throat> so they get to work immediately by removing the thick brush that covers most of the farm. They roll down the clearings uh, and they're planting grass for the runways. The grass is pretty important uh, because it, it keeps the ground together, uh, it keeps it from getting muddy and bogged down in the rain. Uh, and of course, it being a farm, it's full of rocks and brush, uh, and it's pretty nasty. So they roll down some runways, and they plan for two runways at first, one running east-west and the other north-south. Uh, and each of them is about 275 meters long, or about 900 feet. And so for a point of comparison, if you're familiar with the runways at the municipal airport before it closed, they were 5,870 feet and 5,700 feet long. Or if you're more familiar with Parkland Airport, because you're a member of the Flying Club today, uh, Parkland Airport is 2,274 feet, uh, unless you're comfortable running off the end of the runway into the ground, and then it's 5,200 feet. Uh, the horse down plow that is used uh, for breaking up the brush is actually here in the Aviation Museum on display. So once they get this organized, uh, Blatchford talks to uh, the Major and the Royal Canadian Air Force agrees to send two high-performance fighter aircraft to Edmonton for winter trials once the airport is operational, mainly to test them for cold weather operations. And Blatchford really hopes that they're able to move the Royal Canadian Air Force Station from High River all the way up to Edmonton permanently. But uh, in order to do this, the Air Force asks for a third diagonal runway, uh, which drives the cost up another $200, which is 50% overrun. That year, Blatchard leaves office, uh, city office, and he runs for the federal election uh, as a liberal in Edmonton East. So uh, he defeats the incumbent uh, conservative member of parliament there, who is Ambrose Brieri, uh, and Ambrose Brieri in turn uh, is elected mayor. So they kind of swap jobs for four years. It was a pretty tight election. Uh, he only won, Blatchford only won by 200 votes. Uh, he'll serve there until 1930, and then Ambrose Brieri, Brieri will defeat him again in 1930. So the city applies for a license once they get to work, uh, and they are granted the first municipal aerodrome license in Canada. And they also decide to name this aerodrome Blatchford Field in order of the former mayor that got everything organized. So these are the two mayors uh, on horseback. And if you come to the museum and you see this random plow sitting there, it is actually the brush breaking plow that was used at the original airport. Also in 1926, Alberta is visited by uh, Dalzell McKee, who is this uh, American pilot, um, kind of a larger than life figure at the time. Uh, and he organizes the first float, float plane trip across Canada in a Douglas Air Cruiser. It's in partnership with the RCAF, um, so the Air Force sets up a refueling station across, this, across the country and provides a co-pilot for him, uh, who is er Earl Godfrey. So they leave for Montreal, uh, fly to Vancouver, which takes about nine days and 35 hours in the air. So during this trip, they stop in Lake Wobbleman on their way. So after this flight, and to help spur achievements in exploration, to thank the RCAF and the Ontario Provincial Air Service for helping him with this flight, he sponsors the Trans-Canada Trophy, or the McKee Trophy, which is an award given annually to a Canadian for the outstanding promotion of aviation in Canada, uh, with the selection made by the Department of Defense. Uh, so that's a photo of the McKee Trophy uh, and his aircraft on the right. The next year, he plans an even larger expedition. Uh, he's going to Add, he's going to fly the same aircraft, but add two Vickers Vedettes and fly from Montreal to Herschel Island via Prince Albert, Edmonton, and then the Mackenzie Valley uh, using two of these Vickers Vedettes built by Canadian Vickers in Montreal. Um, but unfortunately, he's killed in training during this flight, uh, so they're not able to, to do it. But speaking of float planes, uh, the federal government at the time was faced with the pretty daunting task of trying to accurately map about 10 million square kilometers of terrain. Uh, and around this time, we had uh, a surveyor general um, who was Edouard Gaston de Ville, and he believed that the future of mapping lay really in the skies and through aerial photography. So his 1920 experiments using aerial photography for topographical surveying really sparked a techn technological revolution in surveying and mapping. Uh, in 1922, a forestry company called Laurentide bought a Vickers Viking Mark IV for aerial photography and mapping of their timber leases in Quebec. 
Uh, and they found that this aircraft could carry out in a week what it took a crew previously on the ground about two months in mapping. Laurentide ended up selling uh, EB to a Cal Calgary mining company in 1926 called Northern Syndicate, uh, who used it for mineral exploration. So they hired Jack Caldwell as pilot and Irene Vachon as a flight engineer to search for a lost gold mine in the Northwest Territories. They unfortunately weren't successful, uh, weather was pretty terrible, and they ended up coming south, and they landed at South Cooking Lake. And they're probably the first aircraft to land at Cooking Lake. Uh, so they drop off personnel and they refuel, and then they head south to put their aircraft in storage in High River in September. Uh, when they land in High River, this is the first ground landing of an amphibious aircraft in Canada. So Cooking Lake, uh, established in Cooking Lake Airport, um, is basically Canada's oldest operating airport. Um, and it's one that we don't necessarily talk about enough uh, in the museum because it was really quite important to the early establishment of air service in Edmonton. So originally it was established as a seaplane base to, uh, to support um, opening up the north. Uh, and it was really like instrumental in, in providing this gateway between Ed Edmonton and remote, excuse me, remote northern communities. There is very few regulations at the time, uh, very few aircraft facilities. So the early bush pilots just built whatever they wanted there. Uh, they set up the docks, the cranes, the fuel shacks, uh, and built what they needed. So it wasn't uh, entirely a licensed affair like Blatchford Field was, uh, but they pit built a pretty tight knit community at the Cooking Lake Airport. Uh, so by the 30s, Cooking Lake was like completely abuzz with uh, activity of, of float planes and seaplanes. So ah. also if you come to the museum, we have a 7-8 scale replica of uh, this particular Viking. So meanwhile, uh, at uh, high level, the uh, aircraft that the Royal Canadian Air Force had agreed to send to Edmonton was the Armstrong Whitworth Siskin. It's a biplane single-seat fighter aircraft uh, designed by Britain's Armstrong Whitworth uh, Aircraft Company. This is the first all-metal aircraft operated by the Royal Canadian, uh, sorry, the Royal Air Force uh, and the Royal Canadian Air Force, uh, and it was one of the really new post-war uh, fighter designs to come out after the First World War. So it had its first flight in May of 1919. The Siskin was generally a pretty capable aircraft. Uh, it had a uh, not a very good engine at first. Uh, they replaced it with the much more capable Armstrong Sidley Jaguar in March of 1921. Uh, and then in 1922, they changed its construction to all metal. Uh, and that's the version that went into, into production in 1922 uh, and came to Canada. The Siskin was a pretty popular aircraft for pilots um, and the Royal Canadian Air Force ended up operating its Siskins right up until the beginning of the Second World War. So on January 6th, the Siskins are ready to leave high level and come up to Edmonton uh, on skis, but uh, there's an unseasonably warm period and the weather strands them. So two days later, they manage to get off and they arrive in Edmonton for the official opening of Blatchford Field in January of 1927, uh, January 8th, 1927. So there's a presentation by uh, Flight Lieutenant Collis and Flight Officer Dickens uh, and Ambrose Bury, uh, who succeeded Blatchford as mayor. And Punch Dickens, uh, you'll remember, was a First World War bomber pilot uh, who then joined the uh, Air Force after the war, um, but struggled a bit, uh, ended up selling power plants for a while, uh, and ended up going to the military. After this, he's going to become a bush pilot, and we're going to talk about him quite a bit more in later talks. So here's the official opening of Blatchard Field in the wintertime. So that's Punch Dickens in the middle, uh, Collis on the right, and Bury on the left. So the Siskins spend the winter of 1927 in Edmonton uh, doing winter testing. Uh, it's generally a pretty successful endeavor with one major problem. Uh, they can only work out of the original Jock McNeil hangar that is there, which has no heat, no electricity, is very drafty, uh, and is already starting to get quite rickety. Uh, so that's the hangar that is pictured behind them there. So Punch Dickens is in the middle, uh, Bert Haddo and Blatchford, uh, he's flanked by Bert Haddo on the left, Blatchford on the right. Uh, 
This photo is from a little bit later, it's from 1930. Uh, what you're looking at is the Royal Alexandra Hospital, and in the distance is Blatchford Field. You can't really see anything, but uh, this, this square up here is where Blatchford Field is. Uh, you can kind of see a diagonal runway here, and you can almost imagine another diagonal runway there. Uh, here is 111th Avenue and Kingsway. Well, Portage Avenue, then. Here's another aerial photo. This one is also from 1930, so a little bit later, but uh, it shows a comparison of what the area was like in 1930 compared to what it, to what it is like today. Uh, so you get a pretty good sense of where the runways are. They don't exactly match up with the later runways, but pretty close. So uh, during the expansion in World War II, they changed the configuration of the runways just slightly and of course add uh, a much larger one off on the east. You can also see very faintly here that uh, 118th Avenue actually used to cut all the way through the airport. So it's at this time that they, they remove 118th and uh, Uh, expand the airport. So I always thought when I was younger that the airport was actually, or sorry, that the roads were built around the airport, um, but it's actually the opposite. The airport was built up to the roads. So Kingsway already existed as this very large uh, six lane road then. So despite the successes, um, the city has a lot of problems in the next few years with Blatchard Field. They leased the airport out to a farmer named Mary Watt um, and signed an agreement with her that uh, she's to graze livestock, sorry, graze livestock and raise crops in the open areas of the airport uh, and be responsible for clearing all the brush, breaking the land with the plow, sowing the grass, uh, and turning the airport eventually into one giant grass field within five years. Uh, and she had to keep the runways mowed for aviation purposes, which is a pretty short uh, you, you want the grass to be fairly short. If the grass is too long, uh, it's going to trip up your aircraft and, and seriously damage them. So they signed a lease in April of 1927, but they definitely had a lot of misunderstandings uh, as far as the roles and responsibilities and what exactly to be, was to be done at the airport. So her husband, Mr. Watt, is almost hit by an airplane as he's crossing the one runway on a horse-drawn wagon. Uh, and they have a lot this big dispute as to how high the grass needs to be before it's cut. So the city decides to step in uh, because they're having too many problems uh, and assume direct control over the airport with eventual plans uh, for more improvements and expansions of this airport. Still though, the jurisdiction and responsibility is a bit of a mess. There's uh, calls for lighting um, and a visible wind indicator, but uh, there's a lot of debate as to who's gonna pay for it between the federal government, the city, or the people using the airport. Uh, the city does agree to at least light up the hangar, though. And unfortunately, due to, uh, uh, despite uh, Mayor Blatchford's very eager petitioning, they're not able to get the High River Airport Station moved up to Edmonton permanently. Also around this time uh, is the Hudson Strait Expedition. Before this, uh, in between 1884 and 1912, the government mounted uh, four expeditions using uh, steamships to determine the feasibility of shipping grain uh, from ports in the western Hudson Bay through the 750 kilometer Hudson Straits and onto European markets. So the navigations, the expeditions reports put the date when the passage was navigable at between July 10th and October 20th. So in order to get a better sense for this, uh, in 1926, the Hudson's Bay Railroad is laying tracks uh, through northern Manitoba to a new port at Churchill. And the government decides to verify the length of time that the Hudson Strait could be open as a shipping route. And to do this, they're going to assess the Hudson Strait by air. So in July of 1927, an expedition heads north with 44 men and seven single engine airplanes, uh, as well as sections of prefabricated buildings and hangars. It's a 14-month mission to survey the Hudson Strait and determine how long it's going to be ice-free for shipping. Very, very ambitious project. Uh, involves the construction of three bases uh, at strategic points along the strait. They're using Fokker Universal monoplanes uh, to carry out regular patrols from each base. And the Fokker Universal is uh, designed by uh, a, a Dutch aircraft company. It's the um, North American subsidiary of Fokker, also called Atlantic Aircraft. 
And the designer is Robert Nordine, uh, also a Dutch aviation uh, aircraft designer. Uh, and Robert Nordine is become, going to become very influential in Canadian bush plane design. So the Fokker Universal is his first attempt. Uh, unfortunately, it has some problems. The landing gear is kind of weak. And it's not able to mount skis properly. Uh, so they're later, they adapt the design into the Super Universal. And he takes all this knowledge uh, much later on, designs the Norseman, which is uh, really the first completely purpose-built bush aircraft in Canada. So, uh, of course, there's a lot of uh, Indigenous and Inuit communities living in the north, so they partner up with these Indigenous communities. Uh, the men help them with maintenance, moving the plane, clearing the runways, um, and the women were engaged in making winter clothing for them, uh, including kamiks and parkas for the station men. So, the reason I bring this up uh, is after this expedition, the government unloaded these Fokker aircraft um, and sold them into private hands. One of these ended up in Alberta. Uh, got a little bit of footage here from the Hudson Spate expedition, uh, including one of the aircraft that is in, currently in the museum. So this expedition told the government a lot about flying in the north and the spe specific conditions of uh, maintaining aircraft, um, starting them in cold weather conditions, uh, what's required for maintenance, how to ship fuel. So it, it taught the government a lot and in turn taught Canada a lot about flying in the north. You'd be forgiven if you didn't recognize this aircraft if you visited the museum today. Uh, there's a, another picture of it in the background. So during this 1927 patrol, uh, they flew about, uh, there's this 1927 mission, they flew about 227 air patrols uh, for a total of 269 hours and 44 minutes of flying. They took 2,300 photographs and collected information on the ice conditions up the north. Uh, they experimented with two-way radio direction finding, uh, aiding marine navigation, and uh, uh, generally it was considered a very large success. That is unfortunately what the Fokker Universal looks like today. Uh, it served a long life as a bush plane, it was abandoned at Cooking Lake, uh, and eventually made its way to the city and to us. Eventually I would really really like to restore it one day, but uh, not quite in the cards yet. So. Because public interest in flying was uh, really on the decline in the 1920s, uh, as I mentioned before, there was a lot of people initially that wanted to pay to go for a flight around the city, but it was expensive, and once you did that, you didn't necessarily uh, want to do it again, or want to pay for it again. So there, the number of firms engaged in commercial operation declined from 30 in 1920 to only nine in 1925. And that's not just like Alberta, in all of Canada, it went from 30 to nine. The number of flights flown by these companies declined by 90%, so from 18,671 flights in 1920 to 1,829 flights in 1925. So, mid-20s, Canadian authorities were starting to get pretty alarmed by these statistics, and they were concerned that Canada was really falling behind the United States, uh, which was already offering transcontinental air services. So bush aircraft, bush flying air operations are starting to take hold uh, in the mid to late 20s, but uh, the populated areas of Canada locked, lacked proper airport facilities and we really lacked a lot of licensed pilots. So the government said, you know, we have to do something about this uh, or we're going to be completely left behind. So in order to do that, they turned their attention to Great Britain. So the British government's flying club movement uh, had led to a significant, significant increase uh, in the number of pilot and commercial pilots in Britain. And since private Canadian flight training schools were largely unprofitable, uh, the government decided that to encourage the establishment of local flying clubs, uh, they would in turn lead to more and more development of aviation across the country. So they would have to subsidize these uh, flying schools. So as part of this movement in August of 1927, the idea for the Edmonton Flying Club takes off. Uh, between a meeting organized by Watt May and Punch Dickens at the McDonald Hotel downtown and a group of local aviation enthusiasts. So these are former veterans like Watt May and Punch Dickens. Uh, Watt May is still selling cash registers at this time, but he's really wanting to promote aviation and really get it off the ground. 
And then there's a new, uh, slightly younger generation that's really wanting to build a future in aviation. Some of them, uh, they just want to go up for fun. Uh, and there's also not just men involved, but uh, women. So one of the first members of the Edmonton and Northern Alberta Aero Club uh, is a woman. So they get formed, and Watt May is their first president. An order in council was passed in September 1927, uh, and the controller of civil aviation was then charged with uh, approving the creation of these flying clubs. So Edmonton had been lob lobbying for an establishment of a flying club, and it became the first Canadian city to receive a federal charter. Uh, so initially it was called the Edmonton and Northern Alberta Aero Club, and then later shortened to the Edmonton Flying Club. So they had Watt May as its, as its president, and they had a shack slash hangar at Blatchard Field. So uh, in order to prove to the government that they were uh, a legitimate flying club, the organizers had to demonstrate compliance with um, several conditions to get certified. So they had to provide a competent instructor, an aircraft mechanic, uh, and they had to have at least 30 members that were seeking flying instruction uh, with a minimum of 10 licensed pilots uh, that were interested in continu continuing their flying. In our case, uh, our formal application listed 35 members prepared to qualify as pilots, so 35 interested students. We had 12 qualified pilots, uh, including notable people like Watt May, Cy Becker, and James Bell. So by 1927, sorry, by the end of 1927, Edmonton uh, was one of five clubs that were approved in Canada, uh, and then 11 others were under various stages of development. So over the winter of 1927 and 1928, uh, 125 members put their $1 down to join, uh, and then 90 of them would pay the $25 to sign up for ground school, which is about equivalent to $400 today, so no chump change. The ground school was 30 lectures held at the Prince of Wales Armory. Early on, the city and the Aero Club had a very close relationship because the city realized that the club was a real asset to the proper administration and successful operation of the airport. So they signed an agreement that uh, the city would equip and maintain the hangar. The club would pay for the light, power, telephone hookup, uh, gas, water, fuel. Uh, the club was also op uh, able to operate any service stations on the airfield, uh, and they would be in charge of managing traffic at the airport. In turn, if any other companies wanted to set up at the airport and build a hangar, they'd have to pay a usage fee to the flying club in order to do so. Once the club was certified, the Canadian government, through the Royal Canadian Air Force, committed to providing on loan two light aircraft, which were usually de Havilland Maws, uh, and $100 for each student pilot, pilot that qualified for a pilot's license, up to a maximum of $3,000 a year per club and they agreed to set up a board of inquiry that would be able to investigate any potential crashes. The Air Force would also provide an additional aircraft uh, for each club for every one purchased by the Flying Club during its first five years of operation. So if the Flying Club is able to raise enough money to buy an aircraft, the government would kick in and uh, match that. So the club's first aircraft arrived on May 22nd. Mott May went down to high level to pick up a de Havilland DH-60 Cirrus Moth, uh, which was uh, Golf Charlie Alpha Kilo Juliet, uh, followed shortly thereafter by ALB. So these are the two, the first two Cirrus Maws at the Flying Club. Uh, early club members uh, included pilots and engineers with a wealth of experience. Um, EGA Burke had 2,500 flying and instruction hours already on many types, including the Moth. So they hired him for $200 a month, plus $2, sorry, $2 an hour for dual instruction hours, up to 300 hours, and a dollar per hour after that, which is the equivalent of a base salary of $3,273 per month, plus up to $10,000 for the first 300 hours of dual instruction. So pretty decent pay. The chief engineer uh, is paid a dollar for every hour of all clubs, uh, sorry, a dollar per hour of all club machines flown. So if the aircraft are serviceable and they're being flown, he gets a dollar for every hour that they're flown, with a minimum of $100 per month, which is about $1,600 today. So of these initial 36 applicants, 35 applicants, uh, there was pharmacists, chauffeurs, accountants, salesmen, farmers, uh, students, teamsters, advertising executives, electricians, carpenters, surveyors, mechanics, and one secretary. They had 12 qualified pilots, uh, 
So Cy Becker had 1,000 hours, James Bell 500, Alvin Kennedy 400, Watt May 800, et cetera, et cetera. So quite a few qualified pilots. So this aircraft that they uh, first trained on, the de Havilland Moth, was the first in a long series of Moth aircraft built by de Havilland. Uh, it first flew in 1925, and it was immediately recognized as an ideal aircraft for flying clubs. Uh, at only $5,000, it was very affordable, it was quite simple to maintain, and the wings folded back, which made it uh, much easier for storage in small hangars of the time. Unfortunately for the club, uh, two of the club's mechanics took uh, ALB on an unauthorized flight in 1929, stalled on takeoff, and crashed in the Calder Rail Yards. The government refused to replace the destroyed aircraft, um, but the new president at the time, who was Cy Becker, found a slightly used ex-RCAF moth uh, at the Ottawa Post Office and arranged to have it shipped out to Edmonton. And that's the one you see in the foreground, uh, which is YYG. So this aircraft uh, continued to train pilots for about a decade at the Flying Club uh, until it was sold to uh, Gordon Anderson of Utasquin. Uh, it was eventually abandoned during the Second World... Well, not really abandoned. It was um, put into storage during the Second World War because of a ban on civilian flying or restrictions on civilian flying. Uh, it eventually ended up in the Stan Reynolds collection and it was uh, restored uh, and is now property of the provincial government. So when you come to the museum, it is on loan courtesy of the Reynolds Alberta Museum. Uh, and this is in the original colors that it would have been uh, with the Flying Club. So unfortunately, uh, for a lot of um, women at the time who wanted to learn to fly, uh, it was quite difficult. So uh, what May I uh, mentioned was the first president um, and early instructor. He ended up leaving the club in uh, 1929 because commercial, avi commercial aviation was really starting to take off and uh, he wanted to start up his own company. So in order to avoid a conflict of interest, he ended up resigning from the club. So uh, they brought in, uh, and so Cy Becker became the new president and they also recruited uh, Maurice or Moss Burbage as the new flying instructor. Uh, and Moss Burbage, uh, at the time, really did not want to train any women. So uh, Marjorie Chauvin was one of these early women who had gone to Moss Burbage and wanted to fly. And he said, absolutely no way, women do not have the temperament to learn to fly. She persisted and uh, kept essentially asking, pestering him. Uh, and eventually he finally acquiesced but only on the condition that she find uh, a group of a minimum 12 women that would be able to uh, band together and form their own special class. So she begged all of her friends. Unfortunately, her friends were not interested or couldn't afford it. So she ended up taking an ad in the Edmonton Journal and advertised for women uh, that would be able to join her. And unfortunately, only one of them, well, only one woman replied to her ad, uh, who's Elsie McLean. So, uh, they didn't really have a lot of options. Uh, they finally decided to read through the regulations and find that, you know, there is actually really no regulations against women flying or teaching women to fly. So she went to Burbage and said, okay, we'll sue you unless you agree to teach us to fly. So he finally acquiesced and taught them to fly. They really paved the way for uh, women. So even a few years later, uh, Margaret Fain and uh, Inid Narquay signed up with, Mar Ma sorry, with Moss Burbage at the Flying Club, uh, and they reported no problems with him. They said he was a wonderful instructor uh, and had no problems. McLean and Chauvin, though, uh, were mercilessly teased by other members of the club, uh, and so they had a pretty rough time of it. Thankfully, they had the two of e the, they had each other to help support each other, uh, and they managed to get their flying license uh, together in 1929. Uh, and that's a photo of Elsie McLean. <clears throat> Edmonton had seen very little aircraft since the opening of Blatchard Field. So we had the Flying Club aircraft, um, but not a lot of uh, visitors. So there was the Siskin uh, that had come for the opening. There was another Siskin that uh, flew up for high level, uh, from high level for Dominion Day celebrations in July. Uh, and then this is one special exception. 
Uh, this particular aircraft is uh, the first design from Stinson Aircraft Company, which is based in Detroit. Uh, and it's a company started by Eddie Stinson, who is the brother of Catherine Stinson, uh, who is the American that came to the Edmonton uh, exhibition and flew in 1916, 17, and 18. So the Detroiter is a four-seat cabin monoplane. Uh, it's got pretty advanced features like cabin heating, wheel brakes, uh, and a fairly powerful engine. Uh, it made its first flight in 1926. So the Purple Label Airline Limited, uh, Purple Label Airline Limited, uh, announced its commercial air service at uh, Bonus Field in Calgary on June 3rd. So they uh, took people up for pleasure flights over the city of Calgary for five dollars per passenger. Uh, you could also charter the aircraft for uh, so charter trips for four passengers were priced at two hundred dollars to Edmonton return. $150 to Lethbridge, um, which is quite a lot of money in 1927-1928. So this aircraft is registered to Purple Label Airlines in 1928 uh, and soon merged into Great Canadian Airways. Uh, and it was primarily built, it's, it's painted purple and it's advertising a Purple Label Stout made by the new Edmonton breweries. So pro pro Prohibition had been uh, uh, active in Alberta from 1917 to 1924. Uh, and a uh, local family formed uh, a brewery, bought this aircraft, uh, and used it to promote their beer. So this aircraft came to Edmonton uh, and was one of the very few aircraft visiting Edmonton at this time. The Edmonton Flying Club, as I mentioned, was very, very busy. There was a lot of people. Uh, very quickly after their founding, they had over 100 members, and the two Sirismas that the club had couldn't really handle the demand. So a group of Edmonton Flying Club members got together and they decided, you know what, we're just going to build our own aircraft. Uh, so they decided on this Cranwell CLA-4. The design for the Cranwell was a product of the Cranwell Light Aero Club, Aeroplane Club, uh, which was built of students at a Royal Air Force College in the UK. Uh, so it's an am amateur, amateur built design. They built two in the UK for um, some trials. Didn't do particularly well uh, in the trials. Uh, it had engine reliability issues, but the members of the club heard that this aircraft was going to do well, so they sent away for the plans. The Cranwell is a fairly unusual biplane. Uh, its top wing is about 20% smaller than the bottom wing, uh, which makes it look quite, quite strange. And when you initially look at it, it looks very small, but the wingspan is actually quite large. So anyway, they order plans, they get the blueprints, and they start building this Cranwell in Alf Wants basement, who is one of the members of the club. Unfortunately, building an aircraft is actually fairly complicated, especially if you've never done it before. Uh, it was a lot, of build, a lot of work to build this aircraft from scratch. So they lost interest, the club managed to get an extra moth, and uh, more and more people dropped out of this uh, Cranwell club. So they ended up selling it to Alf Want, who'd been the one to do most of the work at that point. So Want finished the aircraft in 1930, uh, which became the first aircraft built in Edmonton. Unfortunately, uh, it was too big to fit up the staircase from his basement, so he ended up cutting a hole in the wall uh, and then hauling it out of uh, the ground, or the basement that way. So he moved the plane to Blatchard Field uh, and flew it pretty much year-round. So in the wintertime, he fitted it with skis uh, so it could take off and land in the snow. And it flew pretty much year-round for the next four years. Uh, he upgraded it with a larger engine, uh, mainly to cope with Edmonton's higher altitude compared to the UK um, and people my size. Uh, and then unfortunately, uh, a pilot named Jack Lewis crashed the aircraft um, about 127th Street and 119th Ave in February of 1934 because of icing on the wings. So the aircraft is pretty much complete wreck. Uh, Alf Want took the pieces home, stored them in his attic until the 1980s. Uh, and at that time, the Aviation Museum was forming. We were looking for a permanent home. We were looking for projects. And so he brought the remains of the CLA-4 to the museum and started restoring it. They were initially going to restore it to flying conditions, and then they realized that uh, this is actually the only Cranwell CLA-4 left in the world. So they decided, you know what, it's probably better to keep it safe in the museum. So here's some uh, original photos of the Cranwell on skis. Uh, and the remains after the crash. So this aircraft was restored not in our current building, but uh, in Hangar 11 across the way uh, before we'd actually moved into the hangar. So when you visit the museum, you can see the restored Cranwell 
we've left one side of the aircraft you can't really see it on uh, in the photo but the other side of the aircraft is exposed so it gives you a good sense of how the aircraft is how aircraft of the time are constructed so with this resurgence in the flying club um, across the country it really sparks uh, an interest in aviation it trains a lot of pilots uh, a lot of mechanics and it gets cities interested in aviation and building supports for aviation so the city of Edmonton they now have a hangar or so they now have a, an airport and they decide okay what is our next steps so they start to think about facilities at the, at the airport uh, the Jock McNeil hangar is essentially a wooden shack it's very drafty uh, and they decide you know what actually we need more hangars, well we need proper hangars, we need more hangars, uh, and we need to expand the air the airport. Sorry, there's chanting going outside and it's very distracting. Um, commercial aviation also kicks off, so um, not just in, in Edmonton but in Winnipeg uh, and starts to spread across the prairies, connecting a lot of these cities. So as that uh, industry spreads across Canada and these cities decide that they need more and more infrastructure to support it, it's kind of an ebb and flow. As more and more companies come in, they say, okay, well, uh, now if you want us to operate here, we're going to need a hangar, we're going to need lights, we're going to need radios, we're going to need a proper uh, weather station. So it really spurs a lot of growth. So next uh, talk in May, we're going to talk about um, basically 1929, and the early 30s and the growth of all of these small bush operations and how they grew joined together uh, into some of Canada's and especially Western Canada's earliest airlines. So that'll be in May.